Science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. Hi, I'm Juliette Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote, named for Adam Smith, brought to you by Liberty Fund. To learn more, visit www.adamsmithworks.org. Welcome back. Since the beginning of the war in Ukraine, energy prices have skyrocketed around the world. It's hard to read a paper without reading about the need for energy independence, whatever that means. Then I ask adults around me, and I realized that the quest for energy independence, it's not new, and we, we haven't achieved it. Do we want to achieve it? Have I don't know. Um, and so I don't have that many econ classes under my belt, but it seems like it's fairly grounded in economics. Um, and then... I would think the notion of us wanting to produce 100% of our energy seems a little suspicious. Um, But we'll get into what that means with Peter Van Doren. He's from the Cato Institute. I've had him on the podcast before. Go listen to that episode. Welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So before we get into all of this, what is the most important thing that people my age or in my generation should know that we don't? I suppose. Uh, well, we've ta- I, I can't remember how I answered that on the previous podcast. I guess in an energy, I'll stick to an energy-related uh, discussion today, uh, which is, I, I think, and we'll talk about this later, but I really think there is a, a lack of understanding and a very distinct loss of historical memory about the so-called first oil shock, the events of, of 19... 19- 72, 73, 74, and 75. And uh, even when I read elite press today, the New York Times or the Post or the Wall Street Journal, the, um, the claims that are made about that era and what we've learned from it and how that relates to today's current discussion, I think um, I would argue there's been... Uh, so young people need to know what really happened in the early 70s about oil uh, and the oil shock. And um, so we'll talk about that today, I guess. Yeah. um, In that same vein, there was this this chart published recently by Axios showing that for the first time ever, U.S. consumption of petroleum products roughly equated to our production of them. The U.S. is also now a top producer of oil. And the chart was titled in in an article, the U.S. is now energy independent. What does energy independence mean? And when was that concept born? (laughs) To to a well-trained economist, energy independence is a meaningless concept. uh, (laughs) It's it's just stupid. Um, In the following sense, if the notion that is being argued is that being energy independent, and we'll have to figure out what that means. If you could attain that, you would be insulated from price shocks because of disruptions to supply or increases in demand for said product uh, around the world. And somehow you made more than you produced or equal to what you produced that somehow the shock in the market elsewhere in the world, you would that the U.S. would be unaffected by that, or any country that would be that was quote energy independent would be un, unaffected by the price shock. Well, that is just patently false, right? And so think of a you don't have to think of the U.S. Just think of Norway. I mean, Norway, right? The North Sea oil fields have made Norway and Great Britain particularly Norway, large, Norway produces much more fossil fuel energy than it consumes. And yet prices in Norway are not insulated from the world market. And, and that's the key point. As, as long as the there's free trade and as long as the product in question is traded in world markets – 
the amount you produce or the amount you import does not affect the price that you pay full stop. It's just um, the concept is people who traffic in the concept tend not to be economists and they tend to be foreign policy people. And um, so I call this disparagingly kind of guys from Langley and turtleneck discussion, right? Make believe they were old on, on spy movies and wore turtlenecks or something and, and, and uh, fit the stereotype of spooks. Then there is a, a lot of discussion at leading master's programs in foreign policy uh, in the DC area about energy and energy security and things like that. And the notion is that somehow if you import stuff from other countries, you are then vulnerable to their demands. And this, of course, starts from the oil shock of in the early 70s, the so-called Saudi oil embargo, which, quote, every time it's mentioned in the news, right, you've seen uh, I was a, a young adult then, and, and you've seen pictures of gas lines and, you know, panic at the pump and other such descriptions of the life of in 1973, 74, and 75. I lived through it, actually. And ironically, in the summer of 72 and summer of 73, I worked my summer part-time job to get money for college. I worked in a gas station. So <laughs> it was an extremely unpleasant time to work in a gas station because people spit at you and did things saying you were responsible for the increased price of gasoline, which back then went from, oh, kind of 26 cents a gallon to 30 something cents a gallon. And there was outrage, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the discussion, uh, of energy independence and energy as a foreign policy tool uh, makes no sense in economic terms, but it's, it's a foreign policy discussion. And it all starts with the alleged attempt by Saudi Arabia to discipline our support for Israel after the 1973 Yom Kippur war uh, and punish us by quote, not exporting oil to the United States and making us, you know, bend to their will. Um, so that's where it starts. Um, we can go on and I can talk about the what the data show about imports and things back then and, and the role that uh, and what I think, uh, I think the economics literature thinks was much more, in fact, totally responsible for the panic at the pump in the gas lines uh, back in the 70s. And it wasn't the Saudi embargo. So then what was it? Well, but President Nixon, uh, inflation in the early 70s reached 5%. And President Nixon panicked and put the country in a 90-day price freeze and on a total freeze on all prices and wages for 90 days. Can you imagine that, right? And he was a Republican. So, <laughs> but... Um, he was a, anyway, we had a wage and price freeze and then it went through phases by the end, after the 90 days, it was lifted on most things, but price controls on petroleum remained in particular on petroleum imports. And what that did was be, so, so under the rules, the major oil companies that imported oil from around the world that then supplied uh, independent gas stations in the United States, non-branded gas stations, the major oil companies were prohibited under the price control rules of President Nixon. And then by the Emergency Petroleum Allocation Act of 1973, which was passed in September of 73, continued these price controls. 
the majors were not allowed to pass on the higher costs of imports to consumers. So guess what the majors did? <laughs> they, they, they reduced their imports, right? If you, I mean, if, if you lost money on every barrel of oil you imported into the United States, you would probably stop doing so. And that's what they did. Now, they then invoked what's called force majeure clauses in their contracts with independent gas stations. So the shortages that you see in pictures from the 70s and the political storm that ensued was the fact that the mobile and Exxon and Shell stations were open and fully stocked and the independents had been cut off by the majors because the majors could not recoup the cost of imports. So the majors reserved their domestic supplies for their own stations and they reduced imports to both themselves, but then they invoked these contract clauses to cut off the independents. And that led to odd even rationing and all sorts of things. Um, so it was Nixon's wage and price controls followed by the Petroleum Allocation Act of 1973, which continued those controls that led to the so-called gas crisis um, in 1973. It was not, quote, the Saudi embargo in the United States. So today I looked up in the, uh, uh, the January 1975 monthly energy review it's now all online. I used to get it in paper way back when. And so the monthly energy review for 1975 produced by the Department of Energy in the United States, um, it lists imports by month for crude oil. And for 1972, we averaged 2.22 million barrels a day. 1973, 3.24 million barrels a day. 1970, oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, 72, 2.22, 73, 3.24 million barrels a day. 1974, 3.5 million barrels a day. In 1975, 4.1 million barrels a day. So if you look at the import data, right, you don't see any sharp decline. And you don't, in other words, if you look at these original data, you sort of say, well, what, what was the what was the Saudi embargo about? Well, there's a famous oil economist um, named Maury Edelman, who used to teach at MIT. Um, he's now deceased. He died a few years ago at age 96. And I, I will quote from his book, um, which is Genie Out of the Bottle. It's a book on the oil industry. It's MIT Press, 1995. And I wrote a blog post upon his death uh, for the Cato blog in, in 2014. And I <clears throat> quoted at length from his book about the Saudi oil embargo of 1973. And I'm here quoting Edelman. Conventional wisdom is that the Middle Eastern nations wield an oil weapon that they can use to punish the United States or any other nation. In support of this belief, many people point to the 73 oil embargo, and he has that term in quotes, against the United States by Arab members of OPEC. And then he has a parenthesis, except Iraq, Saddam Hussein actually profited from the quote embargo, <laughs> end quote, end parenthesis. <laughs> Secretary of State Henry Kissinger cruised around the Middle East many times to negotiate an end, again in quotes, to the embargo. Ten years later, he explained that the significance of the embargo was psychological, not economic. Recently, the London Economist quoted approvingly what I said, this being Edelman, in July 1973. If an embargo was declared, it would have no effect because diversion would nullify it. And so it was. The embargo against the United States never happened and could not happen. The miserable mile-long lines outside U.S. gasoline stations resulted from domestic price controls and allocations, not from any embargo. We ought not to blame the Arabs for what we did to ourselves. So, I mean, that's just, what if that quote were taught in every high school social studies class? Do you really, I mean, <laughs> so 
you asked me what should young people know that they really don't. Well, it's not just young people. I think most Americans would think that that quote that I read you came from some nut job writing a book in some, you know, or writing a blog post on some whatever blog uh, or website that was, you know, not legitimate of it in any sense. Well, this was an MIT press book from 1995. All right. It's just so, um, Anyway, that that's yeah. so energy independence so, comes out of all that context and, and a false understanding of what what went on then. Yeah, so that mistaken well, so the mistaken belief that the cause was this embargo um, leads to the idea that we should be energy independent. And when people hear energy independent, they mean they they assume that it means and they want it to mean, and this is the goal, that we won't have to import any of these products anymore. Is that true? And if not, what's wrong about that assumption? Well, again, the premise of whether you care about imports or not, I think is not about, well, until recently, we need to talk about the, the Russia context is different. But until mm-hmm. recently, the concern was not import or export per se. It was susceptibility to price shocks. And the thought was, incorrect thought, is that if you produced equal to or more than you consumed, if a price shock occurred somewhere else in the world, you would be insulated from that price shock. But since oil is traded in world markets, as it doesn't matter how much you import, it's just it's because there's trade. If the markets were totally balkanized and every country produced its own energy and no energy was traded anywhere, right? If that were true, then something called energy independence would be an airtight uh, guard against the effect of whatever happened in some other country because there was no trade. But as long as there's trade greater than zero, your place in the world market, be you a net importer like Japan, right? Japan doesn't produce any energy at all. It has to import everything. And it's an island. And notice one of the reasons it attacked in first in World War II is it worried greatly because the U.S. had threatened for various foreign policy purposes to totally embargo Japan against any oil imports back in the 40s. And again, if so in the context of what it means to cut someone off like an embargo, it's only possible if you're an island and there's a naval blockade that blocks trade in the commodity in question and the blockade is airtight. Otherwise, what happens when a country embargoes you and doesn't quote export to you? And as Edelman, the Edelman quote I quoted said, there's diversion. Things go elsewhere and then get relabeled and then you import it from some other country. And so you could think of it as an embargo as a tax. It increases the kind of paperwork and literal costs of finding something and getting it because it's a kind of black market, right? So Saudi Arabia won't directly send to the U.S., but it sent it to the Netherlands in Rotterdam. And then in Rotterdam, it got relabeled and put on another tanker. And then it was owned by somebody else. And then we didn't import it from Saudi Arabia, if you see what I'm up to. And the the good economic way of thinking about that is that as an embargo, it does, inc- it does change prices. It, inc- it, it acts like a tax on the thing in question. That makes a lot of sense. Um, but why then, why do we even, given that we produce so much energy, why do we trade energy if we don't have to, if we don't want to be susceptible to this tool that people, use, people being countries use as foreign policy 
Um, part yeah. of it is I'll give two 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 answers. Uh, one is a shorter, and one is a more technical engineering, petroleum refining kind of answer. The first is think of a totally balkanized market with no trade. That would mean, as I used to say, I mean, I've said this in commentary, you know, 20 years ago, I suppose. You can have choice number one is no trade. That means if you're not a low cost producer, that your consumers pay high prices all of the time in return for no really high prices some of the time. <laughs> right? A price shock. Mm -hmm. You you avoid a price shock because you don't trade. But it's not free. You have to pay the much higher cost of domestic energy because you're not trading for cheaper stuff most of the time. But when times are unpleasant, it may look like to some people a good deal, particularly politicians running for re-election and customers are sort of scared. So that's the, the short answer. The, 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 um, it, you're, you're trading off. World trade allows low cost access to energy most of the time, but some of the time when there's shocks for whatever reason, it's unpleasant and it redistributes income from consumers to producers and demand is inelastic for energy in the short run. And so that means you don't come back very much. You just pay a lot for it. And people don't like to do that. And politicians react to that. And the answer is allegedly pay a lot more for energy almost all of the time to avoid these shocks, but that really doesn't pass the cost benefit test. The more complicated answer is even though we talk about the oil market, there's really many oil markets and there's many types of refineries, right? Oil is a mixture of hydrocarbons that range from methane, which is C1, up to hydrocarbon chains that are C20, which are basically asphalt. And crude oil fields around the world vary in the ratios of the various numbers of hydrocarbons they have in their reservoirs. The money in world markets is in gasoline, which is C8, right? We call, you, if you go to a station, you see the term octane rating, on the mm. on the pump, right? And you see 87 and 89 and that, right? So-called octane rating. Well, octane is C8, right? It's the eight carbon hydrocarbon, and it is the heart of gasoline. And so if you have what's called heavy crude, which is in the C20s, you've got a lot of asphalt and not much, in effect, gasoline. So so-called Saudi light, light hydrocarbons are very rich in the C8, C9, C7s, which are the components of gasoline. And those kinds of crudes don't need much refining, right? They, you just boil off the light stuff. You, The liquids in the middle that form the heart of, of gasoline are saved by the refinery. And then the really bad heavy stuff floats down to the bottom and that's used as asphalt or bunker oil for ocean liners and things like that. So the, the refineries are configured to deal with crudes that have varying degrees of C8s versus C20s. The C20s are, are crack. It's, so some refineries have catalytic cracking. And that breaks up the C20s through chemical processes and makes C8s so that you then get a much higher value added out of the refinery than asphalt. And so then you have transportation routes that are set up from various kinds of crude producers to various kinds of refineries that are equipped to deal with or not deal with these refining issues that I described. So there are technical engineering issues behind much of the world trade and crude to various refineries that are, are not configured to deal with, with this, uh, you know, heavy to light ratio problem that I described. 
So then, should we try to be energy independent? Um, from an economist cost benefit standpoint, I think the answer is no. It just it's the same rationale that economists have for most trade. Does I don't think energy is special, right? We we although I mean now we're going through an era with uh, during COVID and so-called supply chain issues, in which many many people, including many elites are questioning, in effect, world trade. Many people have always questioned energy trade because they argued there were foreign policy implications because of it. But certainly over the last 25 or 30 years in which the barriers to world trade have gone down, the critics of trade and everything else above ener ab ab except energy have gone down, although they're right of center critics of trade, that Trump has activated those. And there's always been left of center critics of trade that mostly focus on labor issues in third world countries. Well, now all that's coming back and energy is now piling on. So, right, we're now in an era in which trade in general is being questioned, uh, even though one thing that you learn quickly in economics is that the term games from trade exist regardless of nation state boundaries or not. And, and thus trade's a good thing. But um, in times of shocks, like we're going through now, many people in my view, incorrectly criticize trade in general and energy trade in particular, uh, because they think that not trading would somehow get rid of the problems we're now having. What they don't realize is in the absence of shocks, trade would make everything much more expensive most of the time, as I said earlier. So the question is, are you willing to pay a lot more most of the time to avoid any of the negative uh, shocks that happen when trade does occur? What are the costs or risks of not being independent? Because I mean, if you look right now, Germany is paying an enormous cost for its dependence on Russian oil. And of all well, the me, national security concerns. Tell me first hmm? what you mean by what do you mean Germany's paying a cost for not being independent? Tell me exactly what you mean by that. Well, aren't they isn't there um I mean, in part, there's the whole, is it even okay? Because do we support Russia? Can we trade with Russia? I mean, do we want to trade with Russia? But then there's also the actual price at the gas station that you see. Right. So let's, uh, that's, so we're just asking the same question that I, I talked about, which is mm -hmm. when shocks occur for whatever reason, be it war or alleged foreign policy disruptions, when a country says, I'm not going to sell to you anymore because I want to punish you, right? Either of those things. During those times, people who don't believe in trade then come out of the woodwork and say, see what trade gets you? This is totally unpleasant. The previous 25 years of good stuff from trade sort of get lost in that discussion, i.e. lower, much lower prices, et cetera, et cetera. So in a strict cost benefit analysis, we'd have to do, we'd have to add up the costs that occur during shocks that are unpleasant versus the benefits that come from trade during all those times when there aren't shocks. Right. And I think yeah. in a kind of present value basis, the consumer surplus, to use the econ term, from the 25 years of good news from free trade and energy greatly offsets the negative consumer effects that are occurring now because Germany, quote, is not energy independent. But again, I remember if... It's not whether you import more than you export. Trade literally would have to be zero in the commodity in question to insulate you from 
from the current price effects in world markets. And that's mm-hmm. a so it's not just small level of import. It's just imports would have to be zero. Otherwise, again, to use the economic term, the opportunity costs for everyone, given that imports aren't zero, would be the same price, right? The world price. Are there, are national security concerns valid or how much weight should they carry? Do they carry yeah, in energy very good. now? <laughs> that there is much ink spilled on said questions uh and again there's a foreign policy perspective which says it's really a big deal and then there's economists that say yeah so the books that the most interesting books i read by economists are books on the economics of stockpiling right that this is Mm-hmm. Because of wars, because of because trade gets to disrupted every now and then for various reasons, countries then say, ooh, we need to insulate ourselves from said possible cutoff, right? Be it in bandages or insulin or oil or anything else. So there are economists who studied the economics of stockpiling, which is take all the, co- I mean, we have a strategic petroleum reserve, right? But the United States also used to have stockpiles of all sorts of stuff in case of, you know, war. And this stuff would we'd buy and then we'd store it in warehouses and then and other countries do the same thing. And then every now and then a shock would hit and then we'd open the dusty warehouse and we realized none of the stuff we'd stored was actually still useful and I'm being pejorative. Some there's some things that don't deteriorate in storage, so it'd be fine to store them. And commodities being one minerals and things. And so then we're again just back in cost benefit land, which is does all the money and time you spent stockpiling stuff worth it, given that now and then you use it? So it's just in some sense an inventory an inventory question like a supermarket how much should a supermarket stock up on in case there's a snowstorm and the trucks can't get through right stores in the dakotas actually have to figure this out because they do get cut off for days at a time Uh, and the books again that the the literature on this is that in general it doesn't seem to be worth it Um, that stockpiling um, is not worth it because World trade really works, and even in war, there's trade. Um, And again, trade during a war is difficult and sometimes more expensive, but in the absence of political restrictions on trade, higher prices induce traders to take care of the risks and worry about them and deal with the fact that they might be bombed or something. And it just so prices rise, but trade continues. And So let's turn a little bit to climate. Right now, a lot of wanting to be energy independent and reducing our dependence on oil and things, um, that people want that with the goal of reducing all of our like carbon output and like all that stuff. So how does green energy fit into energy independence or our place in the world market? Um, very good question. Uh, well, since, so electricity is not traded in world markets. You can't ship it across the ocean. It is traded within continents, right? There are developed countries have what are called transmission grids and electricity is shipped on those transmission lines. Uh, The North American grid goes from Canada to Mexico. It actually crosses international boundaries. The European grid doesn't go. I mean, there's limited trading between countries. The grids within countries are much thicker. Um, So there are links within across European countries, but there's, they're not as robust um, as uh, links 
Uh, ironically, I've, I, Ukraine did import energy from Russia on the electric grid uh, before the war. And somehow they have, I have not read the technical details, but they have managed to, uh, in effect, cut themselves off from the Russian tie, the, 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 the electric um, electricity as a term of art called a tie. So the, the tie that connected the Ukrainian grid to the Russian grid has been cut off. And, but Ukraine has managed to uh, maintain its electric system, except where it's been devastated by bombing. And that I'll be interested in actually reading the technical details of how that happened and how they've managed to keep their system up and running. That would be very interesting to know. Um, so on the green front, um, okay, electricity demand varies by time of day and time of year. And there's a summer peak and a winter peak. And then in the fall and the spring, demand is lower because air conditioning demand is lower. In the And the winter peak arises because of both electric heating and um, uh, lots of holiday lights and things like that. Um, so the problem for both wind and solar sources of electricity is that they are not what's called dispatchable. There are controllers on the electricity grid. They, they have both people and computers that keep supply and demand in equilibrium in real time at all times. I mean, I know that's a lot of jargon, but electricity is very unique in the set of commodities that, that economists have thought about in that supply and demand have to be, have to be exactly matched in real time Otherwise, the grid will collapse and you'll have a voltage collapse initially and then you'll have a brownout and then the whole thing falls apart. Um, there's a, the, the electric grids are, are really thought of best as one giant machine where generators generate output and then it's used and that all has to work in real time exactly. Solar and wind output cannot cannot be varied. It's either on or off. So that makes going to full renewable uh, solar and wind extraordinarily difficult because demand varies by time of day and by time of season. And that means, so. and right now, given our technological constraints, only natural gas and coal fired generation units that supply goes up during the day and down at night, uh, where solar and, and, and wind are just on and off. So, um, and nuclear can be dispatched, but it's so expensive, the capital costs of nuclear are so expensive, that the economics of nuclear are, the owners of nuclear plants do not like their output to go down. They want it to be steady because the fixed costs they want to amortize the fixed cost of the plant over a very steady output. And having the, the denominator of that equation go down every day and then up the next day decreases the economic viability of nuclear plants, if, if you can imagine a, um, a sort of division problem. I know it's hard. I don't have a chalkboard to show it. But um, <laughs> basically, the, the high cost of nuclear, you want to divide it up over as much output as possible. So, so varying the output, even though technically possible, is not that economically viable. So it's interesting to see actually how, since the whole war began, how countries have changed their positions on nuclear energy. I mean, France was closing nuclear plants before the war, and now it's backpedaling. Japan, even, when they yes. had this They've had so many tricky situations with nuclear that Japan is even thinking about giving nuclear a chance. So good, bad, overrated. I mean, you talked about how that kind of how realistic it would be for a producer. But would countries changing the regulations or the attitudes towards nuclear, would that be a good thing? Well, um, 
So nuclear power, um, the, the, the big fear, of course, is accidents and the Fukushima accident in Japan, which released radiation into the environment outside what's called the containment vessel, right? Nuclear reactors are surrounded by a gigantic concrete and steel shield called the containment vessel. Um, the Fukushima, the only two reactor disasters in the history of nuclear power, basically, um, that have ever released large amounts into the external environment of radiation or radioactive substances were Cherno Chernobyl, uh, which is in, <laughs> ironically, the Ukraine, um, in, in the 80s. And that isn't that relevant to current nuclear plants because the Soviet design back then, Chernobyl did not have a containment vessel. So once then, once you had a problem in the plant, it, whatever explosions and things occurred were not contained by the design of the plant. That's not really relevant now. But Fukushima, that was a that's a big deal. Um, we had a we breached. Um, the containment vessel and radioactive stuff was leaked into the environment. We it'd be a we need a another probably podcast to talk about what we think epidemiologically of the risks of exposure and whether the population is overly panicked about said exposure and whether a, a sound risk analysis would show that the risk of of actual medical harm from even fukushima like uh, releases and the, and the then uh you know the exclusion zone around fukushima and getting and saying no one could live near the plant and then evacuating the population there's certainly papers that have been written that says um the Increased costs of electricity arising from Japan's decision to shut down all nuclear plants after the Fukushima disaster, and then having to import fossil fuels and then increase greatly the price of electricity, which then increased the cost of heating and cooling, led to an increase of deaths, which vastly out exceeded the number of people that whose lives were shortened or uh, who suffered health consequences because of direct radiation exposure. In other words, there are then sound papers by credible people that said that the number of exposure deaths from d direct Fukushima exposure is likely to be in the hundreds over 30 years from cancer and things like that. Whereas the number of deaths from people not being able to afford electricity for heating or cooling because they shut down all the nukes is like something like 1600. And I actually reviewed that paper in my journal regulation and then we could, um, I, I could find the site and send you a link and then you could send it to your uh, subscribers to read that paper. Absolutely. Uh, which again says, a sensible risk analysis would say people overreact to nuke concerns, even Fukushima-like concerns, and they un underreact to normal fossil fuel a prices and sort of normal pollution, which has health effects that we sort of don't think about as much as radi you know, acute ra radiation poisoning or something like that. Um, so, yes. That there is that. Um, a bigger a paper I'm writing deals with that concern, but we're also dealing with the fact that the economics of nukes, they're expensive. They've, they're very expensive to build. Instead of getting cheaper over time, they've gotten more expensive. And so if nuclear power, which is carbon-free and fossil fuel-free, at least in its fuel source, uh, although not in the concrete and steel that go in to make it right which are typically are made in fossil fuel intensive ways but nuclear electricity per se has zero carbon emissions at the direct site and and so there are uh, a growing environmental movement is now back into nuclear power 
and there is also a right of center. Uh, there's people uh, at Cato who are uh, pro nuclear as well for different set of reasons. And so then the question comes: Is does nuke? Can we get the cost, the capital costs down so that um, it is competitive with natural gas and or coal fired generation? Um, and the specific question I'm asking in the paper we're writing is what carbon tax level would be necessary in order to make fossil fuel prices high enough so that the current high costs of nukes would be equivalent, if you see what I'm, what I'm saying. In other words, if we had a carbon tax, how high would it have to be so that in a present value context, an investor would be indifferent between a fossil fuel generator with a carbon tax on it, on its output or on its use of inputs actually, versus building a nuclear plant that had no carbon tax on its output because it used no carbon inputs. What, what carbon tax level would make the electricity uh, entrepreneur indifferent between these two sources of power? That's what I'm trying to figure and do you out. Think, I mean, obviously, I think it's possible, but what sort of reforms do you think would be needed to achieve a high level of energy production, maybe clean energy like nuclear energy, at a lower price for everyone? <laughs> If I knew the answer to that, I'd be I'd be an entrepreneur figure. I mean, there are entrepreneurs who are trying to, in effect, what I call bet the farm on trying to make nuclear cheaper because they, in their heart of hearts, ideologically favor nuclear power. And they also think they can solve the capital cost problem that has bedeviled every producer so far in, in and so there's a, again, the answer from a policy point of view is you're asking what, if would a $50 a ton carbon tax make nuclear competitive? If so, that kind of number is what the Department of Energy thinks the carbon tax ought to be. And many left of center people believe in a carbon tax of that rate, many Energy economists believe we ought to have a carbon tax. And then the question is, at what rate? If the carbon tax required, and that's what I'm trying to figure out in the paper, and our, my tentative estimates are, given current prices of nuclear power plants and given current prices of natural gas, you'd need a carbon tax on the order of $300 a ton of carbon emissions to make nuclear plants competitive. The price that's mostly talked about in Washington, even though we haven't enacted a carbon tax of any level, the price that people bat around is kind of 50 to 100, and 100 being on the high range, high end. So 50 is sort of a number that, $50 a ton is a number that, you know, Washington, D.C. dinner parties are comfortable with. Notice that 300 is six times 50. <laughs> and so, the kind of carbon tax that my initial results suggest would be necessary to make nukes competitive is way higher than anything be considered anywhere in the United States and anywhere in the world. And so the only, so I'll give you the uh, a number from my a chart from the paper. If we had very low nuclear capital costs, something like half of what they are now, and natural gas prices were much higher than they are now, and the prices for natural gas were, were to be that high for 40 years, then a $70 a ton carbon tax would make them equal. Well, that's sort of in the conversation, right? So you see what I, so what, what we would have mm -hmm. to do to make nukes work from an economics point of view is we'd have to have nuke capital costs that are at least half of what they currently are in the Western world. And we'd have to have natural gas prices that are at the very high range of where we are. I mean, sort of today's price, given the sort of crisis that's happening and we need to ship 
natural gas from the U.S. To, to, to Europe to help it out uh, during what's going on. We'd need today's price and probably a little bit higher sustained for the next 40 years. And even then, you'd have to have a carbon tax of $70 a ton to make nukes competitive. And that's just to break even, let alone profits. So it's, wow. a, tall, it's a tall order. Um, it's not impossible, but uh, in, in my view, the pro-nuke crowds are, uh, you know, the little joke that economists tell to freshmen in Econ 101, right, is assume a can opener. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a joke about how economists and chemical engineers and physicists differ about things and it's it, it's have you heard this little joke if not I'll I'll tell it maybe I haven't you want to unpack oh, it <laughs> It's it's a way of making fun of economics and uh because economics relies on assumptions right economic theory says assume mm -hmm. this and assume that so again you in a introductory micro class the instructor that wants to make fun of economics and usually it's economists who make this joke, but sometimes it's others who want to make fun of economics. It says there's three people trapped on a desert Island and they're searching for food. And it, one of them is an economist. One is a physicist and one is a, a chemist or chemical engineer and they're starving and they find cans of canned food and the, of chemical engineer and the chemist says, well, um, the, the, the first law of thermodynamic or not the first law, but the pressure inside a vessel is equal is, is increased by heat. So what we need is to take wood and we need to start a fire. We need to put the can over the fire. And if we get the can hot enough, then the lid will blow off and we won't starve. Well, the physicist says we need to teach. Uh, remember, you learned about first class, the second class, and third class levers in introductory physics. So, what we want to do is use that wood not to start a fire, but we want to create a third class lever. And we want to hurl the canned food against rocks. And if we hurl it hard enough, and our third class lever is got the fulcrum right so that you increase the velocity of the can enough and we all stomp on the other end of the of the teeter-totter to make that can hurl then we'll break apart the can and we'll, we won't starve and then the economist says ah neither of you are correct what we need to do is assume that we have a can opener <laughs> <laughs> again it's a great it it Economics does rely a lot on theory. And in my view, the nuclear discussion is there are elements of it, in my view, where people, in effect, invoke the notion of a can opener as their answer to lowering the capital costs of nuclear power. They claim that there's an invention around the corner that's going to do it. And I've been hearing that nukes cost should be going down for 40 years and yet all they do is keep going up and so the nobody has seemed to solve the construction management and uh, other issues that make the construction of nuclear power plants um, so costly and so long they take 10 to 15 years even though the manufacturer says it only should take four years and um, so so that's, I, I think it's a great example of the answer is assume a can opener. Um, and, and, <laughs> um, I wish we had more time to keep talking about nuclear and potential things to come in the future relating to that and energy in general and how that relates to environmentalism and all that. But maybe that's another podcast that we have to have. Um, but before we go, I want to ask you, what is one thing you believed at one time in your life that you later changed your position on and why? Well, in today's context, the energy, I mean, we haven't gotten to remember, we've talked about embargoes and embargoes were always thought to be things that producers would inflict on consumers to make them do something, even though today's podcast argues the embargo is largely fiction. Well, look what we've got now. We've got consumers saying they're going to embargo against producers. 
<laughs> what? I, I, I mean, it's like it flips my. So I'm kind of having to wrestle with. Does everything I said today about producer embargoes, i.e., they don't exist, and the diversion is just a tax and all that, is that also the case for consumer embargoes? What's it mean for the U.S. or Germany or anybody else to say we're not going to consume Russian energy? Well, if what I said earlier today is true, then all that'll happen is the oil or natural gas will get relabeled and renamed and and disguised and consumption will go on, but there'll be a slight, in effect, a tax on it. I think that's easy for oil because you can hide the identity. For natural gas, you know where it goes in the pipeline and you know where it comes out. It's kind of hard to put a different label on it. So mm -hmm. it could be everything I said about embargoes and Edelman and they're just fiction and it doesn't have any effect on anything uh, if it may in the natural gas context it may be different and it may be different in the context of so-called consumer embargoes which we're having now which have never you know haven't that hasn't been what energy discussions were about until recently Once again, I'd like to thank my guest for their time and insight, and I'd like to thank you for listening to The Great Antidote podcast. The Great Antidote is sound engineered by Rich Goyette. If you have any questions, any guests or topic recommendations, please feel free to reach out to me at thegreatantidote at gmail.com. Thank you.